pleasure of leading through the evening today and introducing the session that is organized by the Canada-Europe Dialogue on Migration Project that is financed by the European Union and housed at the University of Victoria. Before I start off introducing our keynote speaker for tonight, let me acknowledge that tonight we meet on the unceded territory of the Algonquin National Indian people here in Ottawa. Now, um, to our Canadian audience, uh, Doug Saunders uh, doesn't need any introduction. Doug Saunders is the international affairs columnist for the Global Mail, and many of you will wait for his columns every every Saturday or Sunday, you know, to uh, to come out. And he has informed us of mostly European affairs, but really his work is global in scale. Doug Saunders has been stationed in London, in LA, but he has also written from the Indian subcontinent, East Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. So a truly international um, journalist covering you know, a whole array of, of topics. But in addition to this, um, Doug Saunders is also a prolific writer of books, and one of them we're going to hear about um, today. Um, Doug Saunders has written th three books. Uh, one is The Arrival City, that has made quite an, had quite an impact on public discussions here in Canada. The Arrival City, the, uh, the Final Migration in Our Next World. Then he went on to write a book on the myths of the Muslim tide, looking at discourses in particular in Europe and deconstructing some of the myths and misinformations that you know, we hear about in particular in, in political discourse on the European continent. And more recently, uh, the uh, Maximum Canada, you know, a picture here we will see it in, in a second. You know, the plea to extend you know, the population of Canada to 100 million by the end of uh, the, the century. Uh, let me also come back to the recognition that Saunders has received for being such an outstanding journalist here in Canada. Alexandrus um, was shortlisted for the book um, Maximum Canada. Oh, sorry, um, let me uh, go back here. Uh, he um, he uh, received the, uh, the the National Newspaper Award, Canada's counterpart to the Pulitzer Prize, on five occasions, as well as the Schelling Prize for Architectural Theory, which was discussed this, you know, and another field of expertise that Doug has, the Donner Prize, uh, and the National Library of China Regime Book Award. And I just heard that Doug Saunders is also shortlisted for his book, Maximum Canada, Why 30 Million Canadians Are Not Enough, uh, just recently. Um, and uh, we, we might hear uh, more about uh, this, you know, whether this comes to pass. So I hope you join me in welcoming Doug Saunders. It's a pleasure having you here. It's a great honor. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm not going to be talking a lot about my most recent book, which is about, about the question, uh, it's mostly a history of Canadian population, addressing the question of how did Canada come to have so few people, and why is, why is Canada's history much more one of emigration than immigration. But I'll touch upon that a little bit. Um, in keeping with, with the theme of, of this, of this gathering, I'm going to be looking at what, what we have com in common, what we have apart, and what we have to learn from one another in the European and North American experiences of receiving, settling, and uh, I wouldn't say integrating, but assisting with the self-integration of, of migrants. Um, and similarities and, and differences and, and what we can learn from each other in terms of best practices in removing obstacles to integration. This is an area that I've, I've had some experience, many of you know much more about than I do, of course, um, but I've, I've been lucky enough to have had a foot in both camps uh, for the last couple years. I've been in, engaged in a number of research initiatives in Europe and in European cities to look at uh, resources of integration and inclusion, obstacles to integration and inclusion, and so on. And I'm, I'm just embarking on, on a couple more research projects on, on predominantly European cities and their migration links to uh, sending countries. Uh, but all, and also, I've, I've, during the last year, had another foot in the Canadian experience in the process of examining the questions of Canada's population, looking at the obstacles to future population growth, 
what are the physical and economic and institutional and uh, political factors that uh, stand in the way of having another tripling of population of the sort that we had over the last 70 years. Uh, if we're going to assume that it'll happen over a certain period of time anyway, what in interventions do we need to make and so on. So this is, a, this is a partial and imperfect look at the comparative experiences of Canada and Europe right now. The shortfalls in these countries in receiving and making part of the mainstream economy and community, new generations of newcomers, and lessons that can be learned. First, a little bit of background, though, um, on exactly what, what sort of migration experiences we're talking about. Many of you are very well versed in the sort of macro numbers of migration and immigration, but, but let, me, let me lay out what I'm talking about anyway. The European experience has been shaped in the public eye and in many respects in the policy eye by the migration emergency of 2015 and 2016, which, um, which has become the defining factor. The million people who walked into Germany, the probably as many as two million people uh, who entered Europe have, have, have come to define the migration experience in the public eye. And they certainly are major policy challenges for those countries that, are ha that were heavily involved in asylum seekers uh, among that population, which was approximately two countries. Uh, but they are also a bit of a distraction from the larger migration picture in Europe. I mean, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in Germany lately, which did see a million people walk across its border in 2015 and 2016, and has had a very challenging policy, set of policy challenges on the national and state and, and municipal levels in dealing with that. On the other hand, Germany is a country that in any normal year without any refugees receives between 700 and 800,000 immigrants. So while this was an, an exceptional extra inflow, and it probably exceeded the number who entered Germany in the 1990s during the crisis in the former Yugoslavia, which was a bigger political crisis. It caused them to try to rewrite their constitution and all these other things. Uh, nevertheless, it has sort of paralyzed the European debate on migration and a lot, caused a lot of other countries to talk about it. But as you can see here, um, migration levels have been quite high for some time. Very little of that has been refugees and asylum seekers uh, during the last while, except for those little peaks in the 1990s and, and 2015 and 2016. Europe's normal levels of migration have been extremely high, um, but uh, most governments of the economically successful countries will tell you that not high enough to keep up with what they feel is demand. Um, the paradox in Germany, of course, is both well, both the CDU, the, gover the, the governing party, and the and 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 the the Social Democrats, who are likely to be part of the currently forming government, uh, see the same set of problems, which is they believe that the country will need 10 million new working age people by the end uh, by within about eight years uh, as part of its population. Only maybe 25 percent of that problem can be dealt with through endogenous policy changes such as uh, uh, pension extensions and so on. So there's a belief in Germany and Scandinavian countries that there's going to be a need for a lot more people uh, who regular migration flows won't deal with. Um, or you could look at it another way, even if you're willing to accept that countries can deal with their labor shortages uh, caused by demographic factors, uh, through internal policy changes, it's simply a fact in Europe and North America and most other places that when an economy is running well and is running successfully, which is true of most of the northern and western economies at the moment, it takes people. It, uh, successful economies attract people regardless of what the policy situation is. Uh, economies, economies that are flagging uh, or in a non-growth position, they tend to lose people. Europe saw net out migration to Turkey and North Africa between 2008 and 2012. The United States has seen a net out migration uh, to uh, Latin America since about 2007, 2008. 
uh, and so on. When, when economies are running into trouble, they lose people. When they're, they're, when, when they're working well, they gain people. And a lot of European governments are still trying to get around this, uh, this fact that there, was, there is probably going to be quite high levels of in-migration, regardless of their policies, regardless of what parties are in power, uh, and so on, as long as their economies are fairly robust. Um, there's just a strong desire not to have it be in the form of irregular migration or in the form of, uh, of, of conflict migration of, of refugees and asylum seekers, which has to be dealt with. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but again, the, what we're calling the refugee population, the migrant population who entered the country in very large numbers, in, mostly in 2015 and 2016, are largely a problem of Sweden and Germany. This, this, this maps from the end of 2015, but the ratios haven't changed much which is that about 60% of all asylum seekers have ended up in Germany and Sweden. Um, and and in, in Germany, for a number of policy reasons that are now famous, in Sweden, because it has, it has an immigration policy based entirely on asylum seekers. Uh, and, and the other countries, on the other hand, have relatively modest levels. Many of them have reacted, um, as you know, uh, politically against the refugee experiences of those countries. You see in Poland and Hungary uh, some really radical closed border ideas. You see in, in Denmark uh, policies designed to exact uh, punitive deterrent measures upon potential asylum seekers trying to cross the border, such as seizing their uh, jewelry and that sort of thing. Uh, so you're seeing a reaction against the high migration numbers in those other countries. Um, but at the same time, um, an open question as to how, to how to fill immigration needs in coming years without these things. Most of the people who crossed into Europe in 2015 and 2016 were not uh, refugees, at least as ref recognized under the 1951 United Nations Charter. Uh, in Germany, of the million people who entered the country in those years, currently it's estimated that about 400,000 qualify to be recognized as refugees and have long-term asylum. Um, a large percentage of the rest are subject to voluntary return policies, and of course there's a political debate over deportation policies. Um, of that, maybe 50 to 60 percent of, of the migrants who were not refugees, a large proportion of them are part of that regular traffic across the Mediterranean, which has taken place since about 2003. Uh, of North Africans and some West Africans uh, seeking labor in Europe. That, that population, of course, was initially uh, a population who were coming into Europe for seasonal labor um, and uh, under, under temporary work visas, flying over for a few months of, of harvesting and that sort of thing uh, that no longer exist. Those visas ceased to exist once uh, Maastricht fully came into, into effect. And, uh, and what, what had been temporary legal migration turned into much longer term uh, irregular migration because those visas didn't exist and instead you had to pay somebody 2,000 euros and now closer to 3,000 euros to get on a rubber raft and the, the cost of maintaining that. So a large part of that migrant population who accompanied the refugees are members of this irregular migration flow that's been going on for some time. And of course, I, need, I needn't sort of get into the political details, but a large part of Europe is trying to figure out a way to replace that flow with, uh, with, with more regular forms of migration. Of course, Canada, every European government right now has task forces going to Ottawa. There's probably people in this room who've met with some of those task forces who come here to learn about Canada's famous controlled immigration programs. And uh, uh, the diplomatic missions of Ottawa are sort of lining up uh, visits to the federal immigration department to find out how it's done and to do that. Um, now, the Canada does indeed have a very different migration picture. About 60% of our male immigrants currently have university degrees and 50% of, of female immigrants to Canada. That's about twice the rate that, that average Canadians have post-secondary education. So it is a highly elite educated uh, body of people. Um, 
It also tends to be a body of people, and we'll discuss this a bit later, who, despite their elite high education status, are not necessarily entering uh, economic success. Uh, at the beginning of the 1990s or end of the 1980s, um, almost all immigrants within 15 years of arrival were earning about the same income levels and, and had about the same employment levels as average Canadians. That's been a big change. At this point, after 15 years in Canada, um, I think if I remember correctly, the chances of earning less than $35,000 a year are about twice what they are for average Canadians, and the chances of being below the poverty line are about 1.5 times what they are for average Canadians. So although the education levels and, and, and social status and often um, urban backgrounds of immigrants are very different than before, the, uh, they're, they're starting off at a lower level and having a harder time reaching, uh, reaching higher. And you can talk about some of the nuances of this and so on. I mean, it's still true that, that something like 40% of immigrants to Canada own a house within four years, despite having a high chance of being below the poverty line. So there's a whole lot of things involving family equity going on and so on that aren't true, that, that, aren't, that, aren't, um, that aren't being measured properly. But Canada is perceived as successfully being a high immigration country uh, that receives people. The immigration levels are, have not actually been that high, uh, and that's part of the reason. Um, our immigration rate is lower than Norway's or, or Switzerland's or a whole lot of other European countries, uh, and we've, we've kept it fairly low, in part through use of various forms of temporary and uh, restricted family re reunification uh, visas and so on uh, for some time. But as you can see here, our immigration rate has re remained largely stable at about 0 0.8 uh, per 100,000 or, or, or uh, eight immigrants per thousand people uh, since the late 1980s, beginning of the 1990s. The recent announcement by the immigration minister to raise numbers to 300,000 would send it up a tick, so that, that dark line there, which is the immigration rate, would, would rise a little bit. Um, but we're, we're, not, we're not approaching anything like mass immigration in Canada. Uh, part of what I'm doing in Maximum Canada is looking, looking at what it, what, would, what it would take to get a population to a sustainable level uh, to deal with the demographic challenges of the middle of the century and also the period when, when uh, world migration supplies will become more difficult in the second half of, this, of the century. And um, uh, we're very far from that. I mean, essentially, we, we, we have an immigration level that allows the population just to barely grow. Um, and I don't, know how, I don't know to what extent there's a commitment to this government. I know, I know from people in this government that there's a real fear of anything that could be perceived as mass immigration happening because of the political risk of it and the danger posed by the uh, refugees showing up at the Canada-US border and so on, flipping public perception, pl perception into a darker place. Nevertheless, as you can see from this, if we were to have mass immigration, um, as we did over there on that big spike on the left at the beginning of the 20th century, if we were to have Laurier-level immigration, we'd have to be taking about 1.75 million immigrants per year. And I think even the most radical proposal to get the population up to 100 million by the end of the century has us rise, raise it from the current 300,000 to somewhere in the, in the low 400,000s. So there's a, there's a few sort of misperceptions in both directions. Um, Canadians tend to look at Europe and see the refugee emergency as being the, the typical situation. And Europeans tend to look at Canada and see a place that has, that has mass immigration and, and, uh, uh, and a very high level of quick economic success for immigrants. But beneath all that, there are actually are a number of challenges of integration and inclusion that are in common between a lot of European countries and Canadian uh, and, and North American countries, and particularly on the municipal level where, uh, where immigration, where the, you know, the rubber hits the road in immigration. Cities face similar challenges. Institutions, schools face similar challenges. Uh, economies face similar challenges in allowing the next wave of newcomers to have the ex sort of experiences that the previous waves did. So my unit of analysis, as you know from things I've written in the past, is what I call the arrival city, which is the city within the city, the network uh, of 
mutual assistance and interconnection that migrants form when they first settle in, in a place, and often for a very long time after they first settle. And, and I tend to examine the early integration experiences in terms of how migrant communities use the resources of the city or the resources of the, of the neighborhood around them and the resources of the larger econ uh, economy around them to self-integrate, to make themselves part of the economic system, the educational system, the cultural system, the political system. Um, and I'm exam I've examined success and failure in integration in terms of obstacles to self-integration placed in the way by the institutions of a country, often by the, the characteristics of the place of, of first settlement, uh, and so on. And um, there are many migrant groups in Europe and North America who do not form the sort of classic arrival city clusters, who don't, who don't form Little Italy's or Chinatowns and so on. I used to point to um, the Filipinos in Canada, who've been the largest, uh, the largest immigration group to Canada for most of the last decade, as being typical of that, who have more virtual communities because of the nature of employment. Uh, but I notice in both Surrey, BC, and in North York and Toronto, we now have the formation of very distinct and concentrated Filipino uh, districts and communities. So those, those physical networks of mutual assistance, even in the virtual age, often do take shape. Uh, and so on. But it, anyway, beyond, beyond trying to define what an arrival city is, let's just say it's useful to examine the way people use or lose access to the tools of self-integration around them. And I'm using a very limited definition of integration as being inclusion, inclusion in the economic and educational system to the same degree as average citizens of the country that you've arrived in. Um, Part of my underlying assumption is, is that if you can get up to the same level of income and the same number of years of education w within a generation or two as the population around you, then the, the cultural stuff tends to be, it doesn't take care of itself completely, but it, it becomes much less of a problem or a controversy uh, and that sort of thing. And I, and I think that can be borne out. What we see in a lot of cities in Europe and what we see the potential for in Canada a lot now is for people to settle in places where there are not the resources for full inclusion in the economy, the educational system, the cultural system, and so on. Um, that's partly geographic, and I'll address that at the end. I've been doing a lot of work on that lately. Um, Often the physical places where people settle lack the things you need. The classic immigrant trajectory in North America is to settle in a place where you rent, first you live in poor quarters provided to you by people from a similar background. Uh, you maybe, then you maybe you rent a room and rent a whole house. Then, may, then you try to purchase a house as soon as possible and you, you seek employment but also operate small business ventures in usually the same, the, the same neighborhood and sometimes the same building that you live in, uh, which is ideally located close to a lot of foot traffic of middle class people who will spend money in your district. And you use this income and the rising value of your real estate as both social and economic capital to finance the further education of the second generation and so on. That's sort of the classic North American model. And then maybe you disperse outward uh, or something like that. that. That has broken down in a number of physical ways and also in a number of institutional ways that, that I'll get into. Um, and in Europe, we see that when, when people find that their trajectory upon arriving is blocked, um, that their form of migration does not allow them to be included as citizens, when their form of physical life does not allow them to engage with the economy, when their form of housing does not allow them to invest in their communities, uh, when the way the school system works encourages the second generation to disengage from education, um, that you see what should be a network of tools for self-integration become a place where you experience spirals of intergenerational decline. Um, and part of what I'll be looking at here are some of the interventions I've seen that attempt and in some cases succeed in arresting those spirals of decline uh, in migrant neighborhoods. But first, uh, first what I call the grid. This, is, this came out of an exercise I did over a couple years with the, with the World Bank. Um, 
with their labor migration department and with the uh, and with the Bertelsmann Foundation, where we looked at barriers to integration of labor migrants in cities in the West. It was an unusual project for those institutions because it looked at people from the developing world. Uh, as, as their fates are affected by people in the West. But this is a very simplified version of a sort of template we developed uh, of the resources that people need upon arriving uh, to become fully included in the economy and the social structure of a country. And if you flip that around, the ob if those things are missing, the obstacles. There, some of them are physical barriers in the form of housing, transportation, and the ability to, to, uh, to securely have those things, and um, some of them are institutional things, particularly in the form of schools, but I would, I would name a number, number of other public institutions uh, that <laughs> aid to migration. Economic resources and barriers, both in the ability to gain employment and increasingly the ability to start businesses. Um, I think one of the big changes in the 21st century and the late 19th century is the shift from a significant proportion of migrants from being units of labor to be plugged into factories and farms and so on to being units of uh, not necessarily of employment but of, of wider activity in the economy. Um, what we see and measure in Canada a lot is what among people who've been like less than 15 years in Canada is what development economists call portfolios of the poor which is earning money through a little bit of contract or part-time labor over here, um, a little bit of working in your friend's shop over there, a little bit of running your own buy and sell retail over there, uh, a little bit of gig economy stuff and Uber driving over there, uh, and, 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 and various informal and formal mixes of employment that add up to enough of a living but are, but are very, very hard to gauge. Um, so we have to understand that the economic resources and barriers are no longer simply simple matters of, of employment and so on, although employment and skills recognition and things like that are important. And finally, the political factors, which I would include citizenship as being a big one, but, but also inclusion in political processes and institutions, recognition of credentials, uh, uh, and let's say not being racially rejected as being a non person in the place where you're living. Um, you notice I'm not, I'm not including racism as an obstacle here, which does not mean I'm discounting it or regarding it as a minor factor. I'm simply trying to outline all of these factors as often being the physical and, in, and geographic and institutional manifestations of racial and cultural discrimination. Uh, and so on. It rarely manifests itself by itself as a, as a get out phenomenon, but very often as a set of, of exclusions or lacks of resources of the sort that we see here. I'm, I'm going to do this backwards. I often start talking about the physical barriers and, and, the, and the, the, the geographic stuff, partly because it has the nicest pictures, but I'd like, I'm going to do this a little bit backwards and talk about citizenship and inclusion first. Partly because those are very important factors to look at in examining the differences between the European and North American experiences uh, in migration. Migrants, of course, as, we've, as you all know, and as I've said, are not one type of person. There are many types of people who enter a country and they have many different types of status and that is handled differently by different countries. This is a, a useful, if somewhat overcomplicated, uh, diagram that the World Health Organization, of all people, usefully put together, showing the different types of migrants they're dealing with and the way they overlap. Uh, irregular or undocumented migrants, trafficking victims, uh, asylum refugees who then become asylum seekers. I added that straight red line there because that's the, that's the piece that's missing from Canada. Um, that's, that's the piece that exists in Canada, I should say, that's missing from Europe is an ability to turn refugees directly into being economic migrants. And a lot, of the, a lot of the obstacles to inclusion and integration are caused by a lack of pathways between these different categories. A lack of ability from be, moving to being a, a refugee, to being a recognized asylum seeker, to being a regular economic migrant, to being a citizen. Um, 
Canada's been pretty good on this front with some exceptions. Generally speaking, once people are recognized as being refugees under the 1951 Charter, they have a very quick pathway to being accepted as being economic immigrants very quickly, and i.e. being able to seek employment, uh, and then to being citizens fairly quickly, certainly compared to almost any European country which range from extremes like many of the Scandinavian countries, which do not, simply do not allow refugees uh, to seek work even after years there. Um, they regard them as a fixed category of people who are to be treated generously and given housing and social assistance, uh, but not to be part of the economy. Um, which is an extreme barrier to integration has caused a number of problems. To the situation in Germany, for example, where you're, you're not allowed to become part of the economy until you've learned the language. There are a number of, this is a, this is a big sort of schism in terms of the political acceptance of migrants between most European countries and let's say English speaking countries. Um, it's the difference between believing that immigrants can integrate fully before they learn the language, which I think is a baseline assumption for most Canadians and, and Americans, uh, is that your grandparents came and they never really learned the language, but they ran a shop that sold to other people of the same cultural background as you, and they did fine and they got everyone into school. So we all recognize our own, if we come from a non-English speaking background or French speaking, we recognize our own immigrant families as having integrated just fine without having learned the language. Whereas in most continental European polities, uh, the really rock solid assumption is that integration equals learning the language. That that, that is often 100% of what Im immigration is all, is all about. I certainly had a long, I had a long argument about this with the German housing minister, who I said, you know, you'd, you'd be doing a lot better if you allowed people to get housing and work if, before they learn the language. And she said, she said it's impossible. Uh, uh, learning the language is, is integration. It's the, it's the only thing there is. Um, this is a wall that, that needs to break down. Uh, but there's a belief that, the, the North American experience cannot be replicated in Europe for that reason. In part, I think, because of some of the experiences of, of temporary labor migration in places like Belgium and Germany that, that shaped the image of, of migration during the 60s and 70s, where people didn't learn the language because they weren't allowed to become citizens, uh, and so on. Anyway, allowing more fluid movement between these categories Dealing with the problem of irregular migrants who are never going to have citizenship or be recognized, e either granting in, uh, a regularization to a group of them or negotiating uh, voluntary return programs, that's something that the Europeans are going to be dealing with in a very big way over the next few years. They have a lot of people knocking about the continent who are neither recognized as refugees uh, nor will ever, be, under normal rules, be recognized as immigrants, but are not prepared to return, and Spain during the 2000s is a lesson worth studying, which, which had a large irregular population in its borders, and dealt with it quite successfully by both regularizing a proportion of it, very controversial, <coughs> in, within the Schengen, and, uh, and setting up systems of voluntary return with sending countries like Morocco, but also creating limited scope legal pathways uh, to entry. Often very small in number, but they, they certainly for a number of years those were highly successful in in eliminating the irregular, i.e., rubber boat migrants. As long as there were 50,000 uh, spots for people who fly over and get a visa to be able to work, that cut the demand for people who the 300,000 people who wanted to get on a raft down to near zero for a while. And one of the lessons you see over and over again in the United States, in the history of the United States during the, the last quarter of the 20th century, in Southern Europe, in, uh, and so on, is, is, and in Canada, in fact, in the 1970s, is that creating a, a limited legal pathway uh, towards the desire for, uh, for irregular pathways and, and makes things a lot more humane and, and manageable. So there are a bunch of lessons within this cluster that need to be uh, learned. Um, let me look at the economic barriers. As, as I said, um, the barriers to employment are big um, in many places, but the barriers to 
creating small businesses often are, are also very big factors. And as I said, there's often big overlaps between those groups. It's not as if there's one group of immigrants who become employees and another group who start a small business. Um, it's not as, we, we need to get away from the sort of, um, you know, hyper-liberal mythology that every immigrant is somebody who's going to start, who's going to be Peter Monk and start a company that employs 40,000 people. Uh, but uh, uh, even in the most economically successful migrant communities, maybe one in five families is involved in small business in any way. It's often very small business. It's a, it's a corner shop or it's equivalent. Um, but what we've seen is that when that's allowed to happen at, at any scale, the uh, network effects of, of those small business creations create really beneficial effects, um, both in terms of creating aspirational mindsets among the second generation, uh, creating employment, uh, creating a sense of uh, value in the neighborhood and ownership of the space in the neighborhood, and that sort of thing, and, and fostering intergenerational economic mobility. Uh, in, in a lot of ways. So, so the, it's important to recognize that the ability to start a business is important. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, both in Europe and North America, it's become increasingly difficult for immigrants to start businesses, both because of their immigration status and because of the low income at which they start. Um, we've, made it, we've made a lot of these things prohibitively difficult. We've made seeking employment very difficult in many cases because of our lack of credential recognition. Um, which is a big issue in Canada. Um, we've made starting small businesses very, very difficult, partly because of the physical spaces where immigrants now settle, which, where it's not physically possible and not allowed, and I'll get into that with some pictures a little later, often because of regulatory barriers that are much, much tougher than before. Um, some of these sound petty until you're on the ground. I had a funny discussion with uh, the family of the Aleppo family that I co-sponsor, like most Canadians do nowadays, uh, who, after their year of, of doing crummy jobs, uh, wanted to start a, wanted to start some sort of business. And the dad said, "Well, I, I want to open a little like kebab shop type of type of place." Our family had an experience doing that, and I was very Anglo-Saxon Canadian. I said, "Oh, you got to look out for that. It's uh, uh, there's probably a lot of health regulations and that sort of thing." And they were like. They were like, we looked into that, it's fine, it's fine. But they said, it's, it is very expensive. It would cost, so to start a little street stall would cost, you'd have to buy a ventilation hood that costs about $60,000 just to get started and so on, which is, which is a tough entry point. It's amazing how many people do it, um, given the high levels of investment required and that sort of thing. So there, I had an interesting argument with the Toronto, um, what was the department? Department of Health, director of the Department of Health about whether they should lower hygiene standards for, uh, for low levels of food service in, in, in new immigrant districts, which is, uh, it's almost like telling a German official that, that learning German might not be important for, for integration. In, 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 in Canadian cities, the idea, the idea that you could maybe lower the standards, remember when we're talking about hygiene, we're generally not talking about cockroach control or things like that. We're talking about that $60,000 ventilation hood uh, or having two, two steel egress doors or that sort of thing. Um, and certainly there's an understanding that a lot of the places where people now live do not have the physical spaces to start small business and, and the rules are, are, are too difficult and so on. As a consequence, or as a result, we see different poverty levels. As I mentioned, in Canada, a su surprising proportion of immigrants are still in poverty 15 years after arriving, despite having been elite middle class people in the place that they came from, often because of the lack of credential recognition. Um, the cliche that every taxi driver in a Canadian city has a, has a master's degree uh, is not very much of a cliche, it's fairly close to reality. The, the proportion of people who have advanced degrees who are doing things like driving taxi is very, very high. That's usually because if you have a law degree, you need a couple years of, of extra post-secondary education to get it recognized in Canada. If you have an education degree, if, uh, if, you, if you have a lot of trades, you need at least a year of community college to have that trade legally recognized in Canada and so on. So there are huge areas of employment. And it isn't a matter that the credentials aren't recognized after a year of getting a certificate. It's that the ability to take a year off to go to a community college and get that certificate is prohibitively difficult when you're 
on a poverty income trying to pay for your kids' university and that sort of thing. So we have this phenomenon in Canada of people sacrificing a generation uh, in order for their children to succeed. Their children very much do succeed. Uh, we know that from every number, the, the, the children of immigrants from almost any culture or category, with a couple of small exceptions, uh, tend to do as well as or better than Canadians. But this sacrifice of a generation is, is, is a waste that we can't really afford anymore. Uh, it's costing the economy, it's costing social cohesion, it's costing economic mobility. It's actually making economic mobility among Im immigrants appear, appear way higher than it actually is because we lower the first generation baseline so low by having people do poverty work that if the second generation do anything that has post-secondary education, it looks like an enormous rate of economic mobility. So look at Canadian economic mo intergenerational economic mobility numbers through that lens. Keep it in mind that, that often it's distorted by lowering the starting point. Europe is a whole different situation, in part because of the nature of how migration happens in Europe, in part because of the history of migration. Um, most countries in Europe did not think of themselves as countries of immigration until maybe 2000 uh, or, or shortly thereafter. As a result, immigration happened either by mass contract, as it did in Canada in the 1950s, or by accident or, or irregularly. But you have large numbers of First, you had large numbers of post-colonial uh, immigration to Europe, particularly to France and the United Kingdom from the former colonies of those countries, much of which was not technically immigration. I mean, somebody coming, a large proportion of the Algerians in France were never immigrants. They, were, they, they had French passports from birth in Algeria and so on. Ditto with Indians and Jamaicans in the UK. If they came in the 1950s, they were never immigrants. They were British subjects. Um, but nevertheless, there's that wave. Then there was the wave in the 1960s of temporary uh, labor migrants or gastarbeiter who were brought by the hundreds of thousands to particularly Belgium and Germany, but also France and, and other countries, uh, who b became non-permanent, not because of their own desire to stay, but because their employers usually wanted to keep them on. Uh, the six month, a two year contract's tricky if, if it takes six months to train someone up. But we're never granted citizenship in, in most cases, or at least not until decades later, and as a result, lagged behind on integration. That way, often had intergenerational effects in, in Germany and, and Belgium. As a result, and in the Netherlands, um, as a result, you have, you have both historically higher rates of uh, economic inequality between immigrants and, uh, and people of immigration descent and non-immigrants. And also you have sort of uh, a set of legacy institutions and neighborhoods and things like that which tend to promote uh, those big differences. So here we see the poverty rates of Bangladeshis and Pakistanis in the UK versus average British people in blue of Turks and Moroccans in the Netherlands and Belgium. Um, much higher differences. Those things are improving with the second generation. This is, this is a measure not of immigrants, but of, of people of those ethnicities. So often into second and third generations in many cases. Um, but as we'll see from the educational figures later, which, which in which case these groups in some countries have actually exceeded the native born population, the, the differential in the poverty rates is, is really quite extreme. And this is a much higher differential than you see in Canada or the United States. And this is, this is of course, I mean, one of the sort of baseline factors of integration. Cultural stuff becomes a lot more controversial if you're, if you're dependent on benefits uh, or if you're not allowed to be part of the economy or not able to be part of the economy because you left school at age 16 or something like that. And that leads us to talk about institutions. Um, the, the big institutional question is education, of course. Um, and that's often the big question when people talk about integration. Um, Education rates actually are pretty good in a lot of European countries for those people who remain in school through them, throughout the full cycle of school. In other words, among children of immigrants who uh, remain in, high, in secondary school till the end, uh, educational integration remains pretty high. Those tend to be female children of immigrants. There's a large problem in many countries with um, with the, uh, with the male children of immigrants uh, leaving school at age 16 or whatever the youngest age is. I'd say it's the biggest problem in Belgium, 
Uh, it's a big problem in Germany. It's, it's, a, it's a big problem in the Netherlands and, and somewhat big problem in Scandinavia of, of early school leaving among male children of immigrants, which tends to cause a spiral into casual employment, gray market employment, sometimes petty crime, sometimes not so petty crime, in rare but very noticeable cases, extremism, which is often happens through the penal and, and criminal justice uh, systems, uh, and so on. So the spir that spiral of early school leaving is a well-documented set of problems. And I, I, there's a neighborhood effect that I've, I've seen in a lot of European cities and in some Canadian di districts of um, a very hard to arrest downward spiral in school quality in immigrant districts. And you can see that playing out where when the, when the first generation of immigrants arrive, you get the more aspirational uh, people of different cultural backgrounds uh, putting their kids in the local school with the, I'm going to say, white population uh, as the, the, the baseline native-born population. Um, and then you start seeing the white parents pulling their kids out of the school and sending them to uh, a middle-class school and the more aspirational immigrant parents pulling their kids out in quick succession, and then the more successful teachers transferring to other schools until you have, until you have, a, a, until you, you have a sense of pessimism, a lower quality in the school, which becomes a constant downward spiral. And I've seen that happen in a lot of places, in a lot of cities, and then it becomes a built, set of built-in incentives to leave school early because of that. And I think what we've learned is from a lot of European and North American examples that is, it's not adequate as an intervention simply to bring the schools up to the average quality level uh, and investment level of schools in that city uh, because then the downward spiral begins again. You actually have to have a sort of intervention where you make, put a school in the low-income immigrant neighborhood that is way above the average level of middle-class schools in that city so that it becomes a, a target school or a magnet school. Uh, for people who are not from that district, for the quote unquote white middle class population. Um, and then suddenly a set of incentives to leave school early becomes, a, you, you actually have to compete against middle class kids to gain admission and standing in your own neighborhood school and it becomes, it becomes a desirable aspiration to attend your local school rather than, rather than uh, a stigma. Um, and I've seen that, I just visited in, um, uh, in southern Amsterdam, a, a technical vocational school that was designed to be a magnet for the whole country in what had been a troubled Surinamese neighborhood, which has, has become a very successful school. Berlin, which is a rare exception to the German education system, has a very good school in one of the more deprived districts uh, designed to be a magnet like that. And the UK has had a lot of positive experiences with, though not uncontroversial, experiences with that as, as well. It, it can be done in some education systems and not in others. Anyway, as a consequence, we're, we start to see in countries where you're beyond the first two generations of immigration, you start to see very high levels of educational integration uh, and so on. In the UK, around 2010, uh, British kids of Bangladeshi descent began exceeding white British kids in, in educational attainment. This is, this is, this is measuring um, uh, a high level of GCSEs uh, and that's, uh, that, or a high level of, uh, of A-levels anyway. Anyway, this, this is a measurement of high educational attainment, let's just say. Um, um, and Pakistani kids, I believe, exceeded white British kids and, uh, uh, and, and Caribbean kids uh, are fairly close to or almost equal at this point after having lagged far, far behind in educational attainment for, for many decades. So a combination of just the uh, trajectories of integration and, and economic and cultural self-inclusion, along with some smart interventions in education systems in many cities in the very complex British education system, caused outcomes which almost to the point where, well, you see it in a lot of neighborhoods in London where the white British kids seem to be the, the failed integration cases, where they're, they're leaving school early, uh, they're, they're not engaging with the economy, they're often uh, attracted to extremist movements, uh, and uh, by which I don't just mean they voted Brexit. Uh, and, uh, 
and uh, as a result, so, so you see this interesting combination of, of successful educational attainment, but still, uh, still exclusion from the economy. And you see this at the top. This is, this is a measure, this is also the UK, which I have good numbers for, and it's a little trickier in other European countries. Britain has done much better in this than a lot of other countries so far, but Germany also is seeing this rise in educational attainment of kids of Turkish descent. Um, and the Netherlands, you're starting to see it with kids of Turkish descent, though not so much Moroccan. Um, female children of those groups especially. Um, this is using, measuring Muslims, uh, which is a proxy for Bangladeshis and Pakistanis in, in Britain, where we see a, a quick rise in the proportion who have degrees between 2001 and 2011, although also a large, a, a large and even slightly larger increase of average British population with degrees. But what you, see, what you see more dramatically is the big decline in the proportion of Bangladeshis and Pakistanis with no educational qualifications. Um, to the point that now I think they're identical to the, to the UK average. So some of these, is, is this a question of policy interventions working? And there were a lot of policy interventions in the 1990s and 2000s to prevent this type of economic exclusion in the UK among second generation? Or is it a matter of nation of shopkeepers, easy access to, to small business and buying property, probably lower employment discrimination by race than, than some other European countries, et cetera, et cetera. Is it a matter of natural environmental factors or is it a matter of policy interventions? We don't know. Um, it certainly is a much slower uh, evening of the gap between immigrant and non-immigrant populations than you see in, in Canada, for example, where it's almost instantaneous. There's an there was an interesting bunch of study during the last decade in Canada, during the 2000s, of groups in Canada who did not experience, immigrant groups whose children did not experience this educational convergence. The most interesting one being the Portuguese in Toronto, um, who, who are, are, and still are somewhat studied as a case of failed integration. They're an interesting group to study because they seem to come from the same backgrounds and the same geographies and the same economies as Italians uh, who'd arrived in the 1950s, uh, but experienced a very different trajectory of educational inclusion and exclusion and so on for reasons that I, uh, and probably some of you have seen this scholarship, it's difficult to analyze, but it's worth studying because what are the things built into Canada? Was it because most of the Portuguese in the 1970s came as illegal immigrants and by overstaying tourist visas until Ottawa had a big regularization of Portuguese in the late 1970s and therefore weren't able, able to make community investments and so on for a long time? Is it because of the culture of the Azores being actually different from the culture of Southern Italy? Uh, is it, uh, who knows, is it, is, there, is it because of the, the, the networks of employment that Portuguese engaged in in Toronto? Anyway, it's, it's worth studying some of these things in Canada to understand not just, not just what obstacles do exist for some groups in Canada, but to understand how some of the things that Europeans have experienced in terms of second generation exclusion uh, are not foreign to us and are, are potential problems in the future as we enter a changed uh, place. Um, Briefly, this is Molenbeek. I've spent a, a bunch of time there. We all know about it because it, it had a, what is often described as a form of failed integration that led to some of the worst terrorists in Europe emerging from its youth male, generally Moroccan descended youth population. And it's interesting because it's not the sort of suburban apartment wasteland that has the type of urban geography that generally leads to that type of social disconnection and so on. It's, it's a dense and fairly economically successful quarter um, uh, that, uh, that would seem to have economic success. I was there both three weeks before the terrorist attacks carried out by the young men of Molenbeek, and uh, a couple times since then. And the biggest factor in that is the institutional one, I think. There are interesting factors involving the Moroccan families who settled there, who tend to be Berbers from the Reef Mountains, who didn't speak French, certainly not Flemish, and really didn't speak much Arabic, uh, and, and but who tended to be economically a bit marginal, but whose children had an extremely high rate of educational exclusion. Um, the Belgian school system is extremely rigid. Uh, it advances children only by ability, not by age. Uh, it, it, it is very sort of 
proscenium front of classroom teaching. It, the, the Belgian school system is, is sort of like the German system 40 years ago, and uh, as well as being fragmented in a, into a whole lot of subdivisions. Um, and almost seems perfectly designed to, uh, to not retain children of, of non-English, of non-Belgian, uh, non non-French or Flemish speaking immigrants into the system. So it has an extremely high rate of early school leaving among young Moroccans. And when you speak to the intelligence agencies in Europe about what causes people to fall into extremism, they were at a loss to find indicators. People from highly religious Muslim families do not fall into extremism. In fact, they're among the least likely groups to fall into extremism in Europe and in Canada. Uh, people who live in, uh, people who come from poverty also are not very likely to. Interestingly, people who come from families that are poorly integrated by most conventional measures of language acquisition and cultural values and education and so on, also are very unlikely to fall into extremism. I should, I should mention immigrants and refugees are among the least likely groups to fall into extremism. Foreign born are, are generally don't. Um, but the children of foreign born do quite a bit, um, or at least are highly represented among those who do. Um, but one th the, the things they found were experience in the, experience in the criminal justice system, um, propensity to violence, and, uh, and early school leaving. Were, were, the, were the big indicator factors. So in, in this spiral into violent extremism and so on. And you see, you see this in a lot of these communities. So that, that certainly seemed to be the uniting factor in Molenbeek. What can you do to interrupt these, these trajectories of decline? This is just this is a, a final note in institutions. Here's a couple examples of institutions that were inserted into communities to prevent economic exclusion. That one on the left is actually in, in Toronto in Thorncliffe Park. It's a full-fledged supermarket in this, it's a stepping stone community. It's a rental apartment neighborhood that's, that's seen dozens of waves of, of immigrants from every country go through it. And I, it gets written about a lot and studied a lot in the scholarly literature because Thorncliffe sort of sees itself as being an immigrant stepping stone community. And one of the many institutions is built is that supermarket where everybody working at the supermarket is in fact studying business. They're studying inventory control, information technology, small business management, uh, et cetera, and you get a certificate from there. So a teaching supermarket, which has been very good at graduating people uh, from these days from refugee backgrounds increasingly uh, into success. This one on the right is interesting because it was it's in Molenbeek or the area right near that in, in uh, Brussels. And it's a full-scale hotel which you can rent rooms at through hotels.com and is part of one of the major hotel chains that's complete, uh, like the supermarket, is completely a teaching hotel inserted into a, a deprived neighborhood where everybody there is learning hospitality management and, and, and stuff like that, um, which has had good success in that sort of thing, but are indications that there's a variety of types of institutional investments that can be put in. Now let me look finally at the physical space aspect, which is sort of my, my pet area, because I've become increasingly convinced that, that the places where people are settling are important. The class in many cities in Europe and North America, the classic dis high density central urban districts where, where immigrants used to settle, like the Lower East Side and Brick Lane and Lower Spadina Avenue in Toronto and places like that, no longer are accessible to newcomers. The housing is not affordable. Um, in part because of the success of previous waves of immigrants. People like me like to buy houses in places like that. And uh, um, so we see the suburbanization of immigration in uh, every North American city. Almost all immigration is suburban now. Um, almost all poverty is suburban now. We see it in uh, a lot of European cities, but not all. You know, people still send, immigrants still settle in the center of cities like Brussels, but increasingly not in Berlin, and definitely increasingly not in London, uh, and definitely not in Paris, where the classic immigrant, immigrant districts like Belleville and, and Brick Lane are now museums to their former selves, as these people are. So people are settling here in places that look pretty. They have big, grassy, empty spaces between the buildings, 
winding streets, big parks separating them from the city, uh, strict zoning that separates retail and industrial and, and, and residential, which makes them almost perfect machines for the failure of immigrants. You cannot do the new immigrant thing in a place like that. You can't start a little shop in the ground floor of that building. If you somehow did, it would probably not be allowed under the rules, but if you did, there'd be no people walking past on the streets because of the windy streets. The big empty spaces between buildings make, make, are frightening and they, they seem to be full of gangs and often are full of guys with tattoos and dogs and stuff. And uh, it's a particularly gendered form of isolation. Uh, women from these communities do not connect with other women from these communities because of these, these dead spaces and are unable, often are forced into lengthy commutes and so on. So these places are often sort of machines for throwing up obstacles to integration just in their physical design. This particular one was recognized by the mayor of Amsterdam, this is in Western Amsterdam, uh, as being a problem because this building produced the guy who murdered the filmmaker Theo van Gogh and set off a spiral of political uh, crisis that, that basically overtook the Netherlands for a decade and so on. So there was a recognition that among the other factors, the physical design of the place was a problem. And um, you know, I'm going to skip these maps. This is what they did as an intervention. In, and I've, I was just back here this year after sort of 10 years of studying this project. This, is, this involves about neighborhoods involving a, that have about 200,000 residents. In some areas, they got rid of those garden city suburban districts and they put up these. The housing cooperatives that own those buildings said, let's get rid of this low population density. We recognize that low population density is the enemy of integration. And let's do this. Let's imitate the physical form of urban neighborhoods that have been successful in multiple generations of integration and inclusion. Let's tight grid streets, 9, 10, 11 story buildings. Uh, the lower stories of the buildings are allowed to be shops or restaurants or small factories or information technology offices or art galleries or what, whatever the community wishes. Um, and some of them are designed so that They'll attract the yuppies, you know, middle class people from the central city will want to settle there. Um, what I found interesting visiting after 10 years of this project, which has stopped and started, um, was to find that they were surprised to find that they, they, they set it so that two thirds of the apartments would be for purchase at high price. Um, a lot like a lot of rehabilitations in Canada that we've seen, like Regent Park in Toronto, they recognize that the way you pay for the redevelopment is by selling it, but also the way you create a social mix uh, is this way. And they also wanted it so that ownership would be, home ownership would become no more normal. But they were surprised to find the highest priced apartments were not being bought by these yuppies from Amsterdam, but they were being bought by people from the Moroccan and Turkish communities who lived there, who'd made a little bit of money in small business. Uh, previously, they would have moved out into a more white middle class neighborhood, but had a strong desire to become middle class within the, the neighborhood where they first settled. And we start to see the emergence of, of, a, of a, uh, an immigrant middle class in this district, which is not such an alien concept to North Americans, but in Europe, it, it's, it's a very rare sort of development. I was just showing you just the trajectory of Toronto, I'm afraid I don't have one like this of Ottawa, of how the suburbanization of immigration has unfolded. This is the income map. This, the, the orange is, low, is very low income and the blue is very high income. The yellow is, is middle income. In 1970, uh, almost all of the low income was in downtown Toronto and the high income was up in North York and, the, and Etobicoke in the suburbs. By 2012, it had completely reversed itself. By this point, all of the high income is it, and also of the white skin, income, incomes over 100,000, uh, post-secondary education, uh, and so on is in the, that blue area. Low income is, is in the middle to outer suburbs uh, almost entirely now. And if you overlay that with a map of immigration, this is where immigrants were settling in 1971 in that center. In 2006, and increasingly now, all immigration takes place in these periphery neighborhoods that are also low income, that are also transit isolated, that are also uh, uh, disconnected. So there's initiatives to try to deal with that. Toronto now has, a, this is the characteristic form of Canadian housing here. It's not the B Victorian Bay and Gable or the Edwardian detached house. It's, it's the slab farm in the suburbs. Canada has more sl suburban slab apartments than any other country, and it, 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 we have 2,000 of these 
20 to 30 story buildings in suburban Toronto alone. Ottawa has quite a lot of them. Calgary and Vancouver do. And they are where immigration happens increasingly. And their, their very low population density is not only a barrier to the type of economic inclusion I talked about, but to, for example, being able to put in subway lines and, and rapid transit. There's not enough population density to support uh, to give the ridership for public transit. So there's an interesting initiative in Toronto that's called Tower Renewal that allows the old ladies who own, they're all owned by old widows who own like four or five of these buildings. They're privately owned and rented. And, to, and they're old enough that they're going to need to be refaced and redeveloped. So to allow them without applying for permission to, to have zoning for free to build shops and restaurants and ideally like low-rise housing in between the buildings to big up, build up density between, hopefully as an incentive system because it would be profitable for them. We'll see if it happens. To create that sort of mood of a souk uh, in between the towers, to create both a life and a feeling of safety to get rid of this, this dangerous and, and gendered form of isolation, uh, but also to create economic activity that draws people, that turns the neighborhood into an attraction rather than a repellent and creates incentives for public transit. We've seen a lot of initiatives like this in European cities to fill up the empty spaces, including that one in the Netherlands. I just visited a project like this in Mexico City to fill in the empty spaces. I, I, part of my argument is that the empty spaces between buildings are one of the biggest barriers to uh, social inclusion in, in Western cities today and in some eastern and southern cities as well. So that's an important thing. You don't have to tear down the buildings. You can build institutions and things between them, as in this example. This is a school library complex created in one of these dead spaces between buildings. Or you can simply give immigrants, where, recognizing where immigrants are settling, like here in this former aircraft factory in Tübingen, you can build things that are mixed use and, and allow the neighborhoods and allow the people who settle there to determine what each space is going to be used for in terms of business or industry or residential or whatever. Uh, and what they found is that actually turns the, neighbor, the immigrant neighborhood into an attraction for people. They want to see this welter of commerce. In much the same way that we all used to have in Toronto, we also used to have school trips to Kensington Market uh, to watch people doing the immigrant thing. Uh, this has become popular in these places too. It's beneficial for the merchants who live there as well. Finally, transportation interventions, I've touched upon those, uh, are crucially important in, in connecting places. A fail, this is, this is in Sao Paulo, but uh, uh, it was an example where putting in a bus route every 15 minutes turned a neighborhood in terminal decline and violence into a place of success and aspiration where people wanted to move into as well. People not just because you could get to your job in 15 minutes, but because if you had the famous ice cream shop, you could attract people there and so on. Um, an intervention in Barcelona to turn a scary uh, ravine that had been used for parking and drug dealing and God knows what else into both a major subway station that would also be an attraction for people, that would bring, bring people into the neighborhood. So turning neighborhoods of immigration from places that you warn people away from into places that attract people can change the whole social trajectory of the place. I was in Vienna recently, which is very interesting because you have a huge schism between the national and the city government. And there was a branch of the national government devoted to urban planning that boasted to me they had a big plan for how to redesign the streets and signs and so on to keep tourists from ever going into the Turkish quarter by accident. Um, Fortunately, the city won out, which recognized that actually tourists want to go into the Turkish quarter and has the best nightlife and, and food and that sort of thing. And wonder, but you see a lot of these tensions between our newcomer districts, things that, that you keep people away from, are they things you bring people into, um, and so on. And finally, the Canadian example that we could, we could learn from Europe on this one is we need to fill in our existing residential neighborhoods. Um, we need to recognize that people should not have to settle in slab apartments in the outskirts when they first arrive or when their children grow up, but that we need to create density in residential neighborhoods. This is a classic type of building on the right that was popular to build 100 years ago, which is seven apartments. Uh, th three of them are three bedroom apartments and two of them are two bedroom apartments. Uh, and two of them are one bedroom apartments inside the same space as a single detached family house. And they're very desirable apartments and so on. Toronto has hundreds of these. Ottawa has a few that were built 100 years ago. You could not get one built today. And there's a huge need to get things like this built in our, uh, both for ecological reasons, 
uh, and for intercommunal and integration reasons, to allow people to settle uh, and build communities in existing communities. So we need to talk about changing the way we zone and with the way we, we grant building permission. Right now, uh, the existing residents of a neighborhood have the right to say no to something like this. Uh, we need to change the system so that the future and potential residents of neighborhoods uh, uh, have, have a role in this as well, have a, a voice in these things as well. So that the next, uh, the next eight decades of population growth will be as smooth and successful as the previous seven where we got lucky. So in terms of things to be learned, finally, back and forth between Europe and North America on these things, um, what the Europeans are doing right in many countries, particularly since the emergency of 2015 and 2016, is they are investing in housing. They are investing in neighborhoods. Germany and the Netherlands, sometimes on a national level, in the case of Germany, which is, which is paying for something like 400,000 new units of housing per year for the next many years. Um, or in the Netherlands, in the case of the, the, the housing corporations and, and, and at the local level, are, are recognizing that people are going to be settling, immigrants are going to be settling in certain places that you do not want to warehouse people. Uh, you, want to, you do not want to have people excluded from the property market. That these countries all suffer from housing supply shortages as severe as Canada's. Uh, and, that, uh, and that it's worth investing in housing to prevent a spiral of social deprivation. Canada is not anywhere close to there yet, even though we have a national housing strategy. The lesson that Europeans can learn from Canada is that quick transition between forms of immigration. The quick pathway from being a re recognized as a refugee to being accepted as an economic immigrant who's able to work, and from being an economic immigrant to being a full citizen, ideally in a very short period of time, and allowing entire families uh, to do that. If those two lessons could be sort of learned back and forth in the dialogue that's increasing now between Europe and Canada, I think we would see mutual benefits and, and an ability to uh, solve some of the problems before they occur for the next generation of newcomers who will build this country. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating account of you know, the challenges of inclusion and integration for immigrants in the particular view of the city as a site where most of these challenges are being met. We have another roughly 10 minutes before we can also continue our discussion over uh, reception, but I opened up to you, you know, for comments and questions that you might have. Who would like to start us off? Yes, sir. Good step. So, um, so I really appreciate the talk. I think the argument is the um, geography argument is uh, is fascinating. Is is comparatively relevant. I think there's a couple of things that I would be the best caricaturized about the European experience. So I think you underplay the language argument. Because we have, if you look at someone like Art Sweetman at, uh, at McMaster, I mean, he's taken over 40 years of paying statistical data. And once you clean that data, you control for a whole bunch of different things. And you go for university grads and different subjects in which uh, people graduate. And then you lose, you lose income as a proxy, which is not a great proxy, but nonetheless, um, the only event we have is that we have much better data or longer data. And it turns out that what best predicts someone's outcome in the labor market is their ability to speak one of the two official languages. And the longer their people are in the country, the better their outcomes. So the later you arrive, so so that there is even in Canada very good data on so oh, yeah. the need to, to that, that language acquisition is just a singularly Oh yeah, and, I, I, and I, sh I shouldn't be mistaken what I'm saying here. It certainly is of enormous benefit of pe for people to learn the language. There's huge ranges of employment that are not available to you naturally if, if you're not fluent in the language. Being limited to your own circle of, of uh, similar language speakers is a problem. The problem occurs not, not, it's not, it's not the people, it's when it's statu statutorily forbidden for people to to work when they don't learn the language, right? So it's, it, 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 I mean, everybody accepts that, that learning the language is important, but delaying all forms of economic activity until people can prove they've, they've learned the language uh, 
is and has been shown to be detrimental to to uh, economic success of, of immigrants. Another element is the Gastarbeiter uh, situation, especially in Germany, because yeah, we know that Turkish immigrants have particularly poor outcomes, but we also know that migratory groups came in about the same time. Greeks, Italians, Spaniards have very good outcomes overall. So simply sort of having this precarious Gastarbeiter status, and we can run this as a controlled experiment during the Balkans, uh, during the Balkan Wars, because we know that Serbs, ironically, have very poor outcomes. Croats, who come at the exact same time, with very similar educational achievements and whatnot, actually have very good outcomes. Mm -hmm. so and, there's and interestingly, Turks who went to other countries at the same time uh, have much better outcomes. So the Turks who came to Germany as Gastarbeiter in the 60s had very poor outcomes, whereas those who moved to Britain or France had much better outcomes, and those who moved to cities in Turkey had uh, very good outcomes as well, which would lead us to be believe that, that the, the, the denial of citizenship to them and their children until 1999 or 2000 was, was a significant part of the, of the problem in Germany. Yes. Oh, sorry. You're, well, sorry. sorry. No, who's the coach here? Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> you okay, pointed to something. How many yes. do we have? We have one, two, and then we have one. Okay. okay. So well, let's go from this end to the, to the other end of the room. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm on the last bit of architecture, but I want to ask a question that actually sort of turns it around, which is that you focus almost exclusively on urban migration, but not to rural migration, mm -hmm. where a lot of Canadians also sort of live outside of cities. Then what's your solution to integration into the rural community? I mean, it's a thing. It exists, um, particularly in countries where, particularly in the form of uh, agricultural labor. It's not a very big piece. I mean, Canada is not very rural, right? I mean, it's about about fifteen percent of the population is rural, and about two percent is employed in agriculture. Um, but uh, but. What's interesting is the phenomenon in Canada and the Netherlands and a number of other countries of rural villages and towns targeting immigrant groups, saying, we have a shop that the family that ran it has died or is no longer making enough money to do it, or we have a hotel or something. Let's target a place. Let's find a place where people are known to be famous for running shops and hotels, like the Punjab or Gujarat or, 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 or Guangzhou, and let's get a family from that place to run it. And um, I mean, it's in Canada. It's known as the little mosque on the prairie phenomenon, right? And uh, um, and that's interesting because it's targeted migration driven by communities. Uh, in many cases, the Rust Belt in the United States. You also see a lot of smaller towns that have done this sort of targeted rural migration. Now, con contract seasonal agricultural labor migration is a whole other thing that 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 I don't want to get into, but but. Uh, uh, it occupies a very interesting place in Canada. Uh, well, thank you for a very rich talk. I was just considering the figures, and especially the curves that go up, and just to remind us that these curves are just uh, absolute figures, but in relative terms, migration is always stable to the third 3% of world population, and this 3% has not changed yeah. in the last year. It's just the number of Israelis and the number of refugees that are radically uh, come up in the last 10 years, but apart from that, that's... That's an important point. That's, that's a really important The world does not have more people. people have more, uh, more people. Well, also, and you could say the baseline number of refugees and asylum seekers coming to the West is actually quite low, except for momentary emergencies. Yeah, um, and the, the, the majority of migrants is south-south. The majority of migration is from the no, there's a, wor there's a worry that, um, I mean, the supply of people interested in moving internationally is finite and is going to, the, the sending countries increasingly have gone through fertility transition and are now seeing non-growing populations. I mean, Iran and Turkey have family sizes below two children per family and uh, even Bangladesh is headed there. China certainly is, has been there for a long time. And the supply of people willing to, and interested in migrating internationally is 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 not going to get larger, and could get a lot smaller depending on political circumstances in those countries. And my other comment was on the uh, very interesting attempt at comparing the lessons that can be taken from one continent to another, Canada to Europe, and uh, considering the fact that Canada doesn't really know 
Yeah, a big problem is that in a lot of European countries, not just most immigrant housing, but most housing is either social or rental, which, which can be a good thing because it creates a lot of entry points and, and easy accessibility to housing. But that sort of classic model of English-speaking countries where uh, rising value of housing is the main tool of economic integration, it's much more difficult to do. It, 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 interesting is you see it happening because even in I mean, Germany only maybe 15, 20% of the population own a house. It's, it's, it's fairly rare. Switzerland, it's even lower. Um, but what's interesting is, is of those Turks who are otherwise excluded from citizenship and so on, very high proportion bought housing in the 70s and, and 80s, um, mainly because there's a cultural attachment to the idea of owning a house and, and that sort of thing, which proved to save a lot of families from, from trouble, actually, as, as their as their very poor immigrant neighborhoods became extremely popular parts of central uh, Berlin or, or, or Frankfurt or Hamburg. Uh, they profited from that rise of property values. So, uh, but that is a big divide, is, 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 is that the idea of home ownership as the main tool of integration, which in United States, Canada, Britain, and, and interestingly in Belgium as well, is, is sort of seen as, as the immigrant experience. That's, that's really not an option in a lot of continental European countries. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Beer um, is important, but you know. Yeah. I really love this, especially, uh, especially the talk of investing in these arrival cities. Um, I got that kind of thrill from reading Jane and Jacobs. That that kind of feeling of why these cities. Um, I really love that. Similar. Um, I wanted to ask a question about in Canada. Do you see migration in urban in urban areas? Do you see there being a larger You mean in terms of attitudes toward immigration? Or, or the way it happens? Attitudes and cultures are raw. We already know that rural communities often vote differently from urban yeah. communities. Is that Canada has, has a lot of what we see in European countries, which is that the people willing to vote for radical anti-immigration parties or policies are almost exclusively people who live not near any immigrants. Um, that's certainly the case of people who vote for the Front National in France or for AFD in Germany. Uh, even people who voted yes in the Brexit referendum in Britain tend to, for immigration reasons, tend to be people who live in places with very few or no immigrants or religious minorities. Or a small subset, there's a whole body of scholarship around this, a small subset of people who live in places where there's been immigration in the last five years or so, so who haven't had a chance to get to know the, the people who've moved in. You, you see that? It's interesting to study uh, groups like um, the white English uh, grandchildren of the old industrial working class as being cases of failed integration, um, not in sort of a patronizing way to, sit, to uh, and so on, but to, to understand that some of those interventions can help. There's a big difference between immigrant poverty in its conventional model, which tends to be transitory, at least in the minds of the immigrant. It's, it's something you're passing through on the way to a different place. 
And if you end up being stuck in poverty, you, you see it as being, being stuck on your way to a certain place and intergenerational poverty of native born populations, which tends to be thought of among people in it as being, well, this is what we are, this is what I'm stuck with, and that sort of thing. I mean, I'm making a gross generalization. Um, so can the sort of interventions that help with immigrant communities help with certain groups of non-immigrant communities? It, I would be wary of applying that sort of model of, of interventions to remove obstacles to integration to, for example, formerly tribal and nomadic communities like First Nations and Inuit in Canada and Roma in Europe who do not see themselves as they, they, they see them as, as cult, cultures that were impinged upon rather than newcomer cultures and are not, see, not necessarily seeking inclusion in the main uh, economy and so on, although definitely are seeking a better economic and, and cultural level and so on. But that idea of removing obstacles to self-integration might not work in those kinds. But it's an interesting area. Um, and, uh, but I think, it needs to, I think it needs to be looked at differently. Before I bring this evening to a close, let me encourage you to stay involved with the Canada-Europe Dialogue on Migration project that is start, just starting to come to full swing. So if you're interested in this particular angle, the, you know, the Europe-Canada comparative dimension, we have an expert database, so please feel free to, to join us or to, to look you know, what we're up to. I would like to thank you, you know, in particular those who've come from far and here from the local community. Thank you for coming out and Alexander, you know, thank you so much. You're an extremely busy man. Thank you very much and you're doing this for us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.